I wanted to know, based off of that journey, there's a lot of men that come to me to ask me for advice. I'm 29, so I think that this would probably be a better suited question for you. Mm-hmm. Is in your 45 years of life, what are the most important things that you've learned about being a man that you would tell a man that's 18 years old right now? Know yourself. Know yourself and know your work. I think that's the most important thing that anybody can learn nowadays. Because if you know yourself and you know what your worth is, then nobody can take advantage of you. And I think we all fall short when it comes to stuff like that because we're always trying to appease somebody. Welcome to PTG TV. This is your host, Antonio Hicks. I welcome onto the show a man of many talent. He's an actor. He's a producer. He's a recording artist. Mr. Marcus Vigilante still in a discussion about community involvement and things that he's doing to empower himself that he can be an inspiration to others that are around him. So welcome onto the show, brother. Thank you. I appreciate that intro and I appreciate you for having me. Thank you. No problem. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, who you are and what, especially what brought you down to the dirty South. Okay. So, uh, for Marcus Steele, that's the government vigilante. That is the, I guess you could say alter ego or stage name, depending on, you know, what people want to call it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I started off doing music, branched off into acting, acting turned into, uh, me, um, doing brand partnerships once they start seeing me on television. So endorsement, sponsorships, pretty much ushering in the UGC community as we know it today. For those who don't know what UGC means, user generated content. So pretty much what we're doing right now. Okay. And um, I invented the independent uh, media tour. So when podcast first got started, I was the first, I guess you could say, B list, C list celebrity to start going on small shows because we only knew celebrities for going on big shows and uh, doing their promo runs. But I decided to take that movie fame that I had and give it to smaller platforms. So that's always going to have a near and dear uh, place in my heart. Uh, is to continue to do that. And now I hold the record for having the most. So I got 300 plus um, in the chamber now. Yeah, interviews on different platforms. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, making me the most interviewed uh, person in the world, so to speak. So that's one thing. And then um, after that, uh, my community activism started when I um, had a talk with the Cobb County Commissioner. I mean, not Commissioner, uh, Police Chief about the uh, the deaths that were happening in 2020, back to back to back to back to back. Mm -hmm. And that conversation was supposed to last about 15 minutes, but it lasted about two hours. And then it got printed into the newspaper the next day. And uh, the chief of police gathered all of his um, officers and did a whole speech about that they would not stand for any racial injustice or any of that. Um, The couple of days after it was printed in the newspaper, and that kind of sprung into me meeting Stacey Abrams and Kemp and Warnoff and Ossoff and um, all of them in the last election because I had no idea that in America, the only politics that people care about are the ones that affect the entire presidency and on a local level, Georgia. So we don't really know who governs anything else except right. for here. And so I didn't know what how much how big of a deal that would be, especially with me being the first person in the world to post Kemp and Stacy on my page at the in the same like week. That's like unheard of in politics. So I just wanted to show people that I wanted to come at the angle in a less divisive way and in a more um collaborative way, because I think that both of them are very fit to um run Georgia and that they both have really good ideas that I support it. And, you know, my community activism continues. Now, I, I, <laughs> now, why did now? OK, let me go back to the Cobb County. So you see the, the Cobb County police chief. Yeah. So what how what was your interaction with him? Like, how did you what, what did you take away from talking to sit down and talking to him for two hours? And I have a reason behind the question. I'm, well, I'm first. No, I got you. Well, first, let me um let, let me paint the full picture. So. The deputy chief who's underneath the police chief is African-American okay. and his sergeant, African-American, and they were both in the room as well. And he was the only Caucasian person in the room. So it was us three and then him. And what I picked, what I what I took from that conversation from him is that he's not a bad guy at all. He's just been behind his desk for so long mm-hmm. that being a foot, being on foot patrol and really knowing what's going out in the community on a 
reach out and touch it basis he kind of lost sight with Mm -hmm. and um we got to a point in our conversation where he said so what if i'm walking into the qt and i see somebody looking suspicious and they're a criminal and they get away it's going to look like i'm doing bad police work and then i said well on the flip side if you're assuming that somebody is suspicious whatever that even looks like to you and you're um hounding them that's harassment on the other side so now we have to figure out what that thin line is between somebody looking suspicious and you being a good officer. I can see your dilemma from the other side. But the sad part about that is that there's always one side that loses their life and not the other. And I'm right. not saying that both. I'm saying that neither. So we have to first figure out, is that what we want the common goal to be, that both of us make it home safe? Or is you and your officers trying to do good police work worth another human being walking to the store to get skittles and tea and they're not making it back home to their family right yeah I, I brought that up because like during my time when i was running for office i did even outside of me running for office i put together a uh, panel of like law enforcement officials like lawyers and whatnot to talk about how we could during the whole george floyd thing and i reached out to him specifically because of the work that I do within the community, somebody told me to ask him if one, if just just one of his officers, not even him, one of his officers could join to the to platform, who was uh, Latino, and this man straight up told me no. They have a community outreach person, a marketing person, and he was like, even he don't even want him coming onto the show. And I was like, but well, this is a panel discussion of all your peers. I'm like, I got a police chief from Gwinnett County is going to be on. I'm like, I got another police chief from uh, Atlanta Technical College. He's going to be on. And I got, got a variety of like prosecutors and attorneys going to be on this panel discussion. And I was like, you don't want to have your people on? And he was like, no, I'm not interested at this time. That's why I asked that question. That's why I was like, how did it go in person? Because my, my interaction with him was, was not the greatest of, of greatest. And which, and this was uh, Chief Cox. This was him? I think so, yeah. Got you. So, I think that that's another and that's that's the beautiful thing about us having multiple community activists within the space is that um, someone's going to break through. Yeah. So I am an extension of you. And we come as a conglomerate with this conversation right here to tie all of that into a full string. That's the way that I look at it. OK. Now, back to some of your own like personal career goals, like what made you what led you to get into like your acting career and doing music and, and production? Well, when I first started, um, well, I, I moved here in 2010. Here is Georgia from Michigan. Uh-huh. And um, I my stepdad was he he was like a part label owner of self-made records, which the producer Honorable C-Note was one of the producers in that group. And they had a lot of success back in the day. And he wanted to channel that success down here in Georgia. So I had a MIDI board. And for those who are not technical, technically savvy, because I did graduate from SAE. We're going to get to that in a minute. And so um, y'all going to hear my nerd side and my creative side switch back and forth. So when I when he, when he gave me the MIDI board, a MIDI board is a uh, is a controller that can serve as a piano or a beat making machine. And he gave me that. That's when my production started. And my uncle was the lead of ministry. So I would play the drums for him at the church. So that's when I got my acoustic uh, background from was mm-hmm. seeing him control the choir. When you when you watch somebody control praise and worship, you pretty much know what to do with voices, instruments, beat, not beat, everything pretty much acoustic. And then we come from African descent. So you can't really get more organic than that. And so when we moved down to Michigan, I mean, to uh, Georgia, I was still producing, but I wasn't doing it for money. I was very unaware of the music industry. I know with Mm -hmm. the following that I have, that's almost damn near hard to believe. But I did start with zero followers and uh, organically build it all up by building my connections. So when um, my stepdad came down here, I had a cousin named Fat Kid and he was like the juvenile of the group for those familiar with Hot Boys. Mm -hmm. And I was like um, Wayne. I was the youngest. And I was the least trajectory to um, become successful fast because I was the youngest. It, it, I wasn't in a rush. He was already 19 out of school. Mm-hmm. I was still 15 in school. So it really wasn't a rush for me. So when we did that, we cut a couple of good records. We had a couple of good mixtapes out. And I noticed that we weren't making any money. And it was um, at a time where 
YouTube wasn't monetized. Social media wasn't big. Nobody knew social media. For the, I'm 29, so if I talk like I'm old and I'm young, it's because I'm right in that middle part where I'm about to be 30. <laughs> so uh, we didn't know that social media was going to be what it became now. Social media wasn't essential to have back then. If you ask somebody, hey, do you have Instagram? And they go, no. Nah. It wasn't like, well, you don't have Instagram. Not at that time. Right. So yeah. nobody really harnessed their social media following to really build a career off of. until maybe Unless like, you had MySpace. Yeah, and even that was kind of rare too. Like when you hear Drake and Soldier Boy talk about how they utilize their Facebook, I mean, a MySpace fan base, mm-hmm. we really had it for like family and like girls that we had crushes on and shit like that. So, you know, uh, my stepdad came home one day mm-hmm. and he started talking to me about Alvin and Chipmunks and Barbershop 3. And when he started talking to me about that, I'm like, man, I don't try to hear that. Man, I do music. You know, I don't want to do that. So yeah. I turned it down about three or four times. And his fifth time, sixth time coming to me, he was like, man, did you do it? I'm like, God damn. All right, let me go ahead and fill this out. So I filled this application out so he'll leave me alone. Mm-hmm. And I got a call from Chip Chipmunks a couple of days later. And I did the set. I did three days on the set. Mm-hmm. I came back to doing my music. And then I did Barbershop. Now, this is this when shit changed for me. Now, what did you do on set with Alvin and the Chipmunks? I was just a background extra. They really didn't okay. use me a lot. Um, this was like at the super beginning stages. Well, yeah, the, the, not light, but was the super beginning stages of my career. Okay. But even before that, I'm skipping a little bit. A month before that, Trevor Jackson, who was one of my favorite artists and uh, actors, for those who don't know Trev, uh, Superfly, the main character from the remake, and um, Let It Shine, one of the main characters. And he... Um, I met up with him at a church downtown and his mom and him was actually in the back. And I walked past hair, makeup. This is unheard of in the movie world for somebody to just walk on set, walk past hair, makeup, security, walk all the way to the back where the main actors are and just start interacting with them. That's how, you know, it was a real indie set. So, yeah, because I was I mean, like, how do you, because my wife works in movie industry. She's a script supervisor. <laughs> and I, was, and I was like, how are you able to do that? I walked past everybody like that's it was crazy. I just walked to the back where Trev was and we in the back playing piano, taking pictures, <laughs> listen to music. And I'm about to leave. And he like, yeah, yeah, you want to stay and be in this movie? And I'm like, oh, this is a movie set. So that's what all this shit is. And he was like, yeah. So now he's looking at me like, how the fuck did you get back here? If you didn't know that. Right. So now he realizing that, that I, I wasn't supposed to be back there. And he like, yo, you know, you, you can stay and be an extra in this movie. And he pointed me to the extras hold. And I went over there. I did a couple scenes, maybe like 10 takes. And I was gone. Mm-hmm. I ain't think much of it because it was free. Now, I did the album chip must a month later. A month after that, I get a call for Barbershop 3. Now, I am, um, I did the, the first day on Barbershop 3. It was all right. But Alvin and Chipmunks had a lot of white people that was there. Because that's a mostly, you know, crossover film. Yeah, barbershop. We had a lot of black women that was on that set. So at this time, I'm 20. I'm 20. I mm-hmm. graduated from college. I graduated from college when I was 19, and then 20 years old is when I started uh, doing the background stuff. So it's so many black women in there are beautiful and they are so motivated to get into this space because they want to elevate. And um, I go home that day, and in movies, you know, you get paid a month later when you uh, uh, extra. extra. So then my checks from Alvin and Chipmunks just came. I'm getting like $200, $300 a day. And I noticed that this is more money in one day than I've gotten in music for five, six years. Mm-hmm. And I go, yeah, something, something's got to, something got to give. And I go to set the next day and Cube, Common, Eve, Nikki, Sid, Dion, all of these people are in the room eating lunch with us. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, what am I going to say to him? What am I going to say to him? What am I going to say? Because these are all artists. Right. And I want to talk to them about music because they're not hearing on music. They even fucking with me in this conversation right now because they probably think I've been acting for years. They don't know. Mm-hmm. So I tell myself in that moment, well, Vig, if you want to talk to them on that level, you got to, if, you, if you're going to be an actor, you got to be an actor. Mm-hmm. So... That's when all of that shifted for me. And I said, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm officially an actor now. And then I started asking myself, if I got paid $200, $300 a day, and I'm at the lowest level here, and they're at the highest level, my wheels started turning with that with that paper. Mm-hmm. 
And I said, okay, now I need to go get me some agencies and I need to go get me some um, headshots and some demo reels and I need to start connecting with people. And that's when I started networking. And that's when I started building my Instagram following by just passing my phone around to everybody. I'm noticing that my following is growing like crazy. I go, I go from 10,000 to 11, 11, 12, 12 to 13, 13 to 14. I'm noticing that um, every time somebody follows me, that they're commenting on that, like, damn, you got a big following. And I'm like, okay, this person wants me to continue to be acquainted with them because of the following I have. Let me continue to build this up. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I realized that social media was going to be big in the future because I could see people gaining like a hypergamous point of view on it early. Now, what year is this when you're doing all this? This is about 20, 2017. Okay. Yeah, it's about 2017. So then um, once the movies uh, became uh, theater releases and the TV shows became TV One, Investigation Dis- Discovery and stuff like that, and I, and I hit national television, that's when the brands came. And then I pivoted into the brands and I started closing like shoe deals and hat deals and clothing deals. And mm-hmm. then I would take those same clothing that I was doing on the independent media tour and wear them on radio stations and give them rollouts. And then I would take those radio station hosts and then I would put them on red carpets at the award shows and stuff like that. So I just kept paying my blessings forward. And mm-hmm. then I kept networking people that I met from music and then circle it back to acting, circle it back to um, clothing. And then I just kept that going. OK, so who are some of the people you work with in like radio? I think the biggest radio interview that I've done so far is probably DJ Thorough with This Is 50 uh-huh. and Sh- Shirley Jew with Vlad TV. Okay, with Vlad, Vlad TV, boy. Woo. <laughs> but I mean, like they make good content. Huh? Yeah, I just opened up a can of worms. You got something against Vlad? No, no, no. I like Vlad. Nah, Vlad keep up some mess on the street. But I mean, I'm all for it because I mean, people choose to go on the platform. So, no, nah, no, nah, he do good stuff. I mean, I, I'm mm-hmm. with anybody that's trying to do anything. I don't care if they're black or white. I don't care. I mean, if you out there doing stuff in the community and you just bringing awareness to stuff that's going on, I don't care if it's gossip. Somebody want to listen to it and it just make for a good story. So, no, nah, I don't, yeah, I ain't, no, nah, I'm going to be for black TV. Yeah, I can feel that. I can feel that. I was on one platform and me and the lady was having a conversation about relationships and the future of men and women being together. Uh-huh. And she was like, you didn't, you didn't see the stuff that Vlad just said about um, Nicki Minaj? And I said, no, no, please educate me. She uh-huh. was like, no, I'm not going to say it. I was like, well, why would you tell me and then not say it? She was like, well, right. as a black sister, you just not going to be on my side? I said, fuck no. No. Tell me <laughs> tell me what he said and, yeah. and then I will let you know that he was in the right or in the wrong. Well, you can just read the comments. They go, all right, we can just move on to the next thing then. And I ain't about to sit here with you and talk about that bullshit. Yeah, no, I don't... I'm like, well, I'm one of the super pro-black person out there, but I'm also about the sake of humanity. Because, I mean, even in, like in my other shows, I talk about us coming together and getting past our devices when it comes to race and religion and all the things so we all can work together for the sake of humanity. Because eventually, we all going to have to work. We got to work together. I mean, at the mm-hmm. end of the day, we got to work together. And I'm not going to spew some hate towards anybody, especially if it's just coming out of one person's mouth. Because, I mean, that, I mean, you as a brother, not all skin folks are kin folk. <laughs> so yeah. I'm yeah. not going to rock with somebody just because they black. I mean, are you doing something to help out the community for the sake of the community? Or are you turning your back on the community? Because you're turning your back on the community, you can kick rocks. You're not going to get no support from me. And I'm yeah. all for protecting my sisters. I am all for protecting my sisters. But if you're doing some malicious crap, you will not get any protection from me at all. You will get all the smoke that everybody else is going to get. Agreed. You can get the smoke from my guy Hicks, and from me, you're going to get the super cold shoulder. Yeah, I don't. And it is. Yeah, I don't. Because you know, that's the problem I have when it comes to, and this is a sidebar, but it's, I think it's relevant now because we, whenever y'all listen to this episode, it's at the end of Black History Month. The issue I have when it comes to us as, as our people, we're not, we are protective of our people, but we're not protective of our people. Because we find ourselves that when we get lifted up to a, a higher platform, even we're not at the height of, or the peak of where we want to be at, but we're still higher enough and further than other people on the bottom, we don't reach back and help people out. And then when people try to connect with you on your space, you ignore them and then tell them to get their work, get their work done and get their followers up, kind of what they're telling you. And then once you get your stuff up, then you can come back and talk to me. And it's like, well, if you came from the bottom, and you, it, it, one thing I have a thing about, if, if I work my behind off to learn something that somebody else don't know, I'm not going to charge you or tell you to get to a certain place before I give you the information to help you out. I'm just going to help you out. 
Now, can I do that for everybody to where I'm just swamped and I don't have enough time for myself? No, but if I, especially if I get referred to you from somebody that I know and they're of a different, and they're of a, a caliber that with me, if not higher than me, I'm, I'm really going to help you out because now you're being referred to me by a friend or somebody that I'm close to, somebody I hold value to me. And that's the issue I have when it comes to us as a people. It's like, we don't do, we don't, I mean, kind of, this is why I appreciate kind of what you said, like, you know, when everybody, you come into contact with people that you, that you have done something with or did an interview with, if you're somewhere, you kind of like, this is what I'm getting from what you said, you invite them into that space so they can be a part of it as well. And you're not charging them a fee. Mm-hmm. And that's the issue I have is that a lot of us don't do that. A lot of us won't want to charge, give access, charge access to get some of the stuff that I have. Now, I get that if there's a part of your platform, like you sell in the class or whatever, that's fine. But if it's people that you know and you see they're curious about something, because, I mean, what would you tell that to a kid or a, a college student, somebody that's trying to get into you, want to know how you got to where you are, you're going to tell them that, you know, for a consultation fee, it's going to be $500. Right. And it's like, how are you going to get a blessing from that? So I'm right. I'm, I'm gonna get off my little soapbox because <laughs> what, I mean because I operate in a ton of different spaces, which is why my show is PTG TV. I, I've worked in politics and I've, I've done it. I've I'm a, I've I'm in boots on the ground. I'm the one knocking that door. So people want to tell me about politics or how stuff is not going away. Or the system is. I'm like, nah, bro. If you ain't out there knocking on people's doors, you ain't out there handing out no flyers. You're not talking to the community. All that conspiracy stuff don't mean crap to me because I mean, unless you're actually doing it and you see what's going on behind the scenes, like I have. I don't want to hear. It. And then technology, I'm, I've been doing, I'm an engineer for over 20 something years. So I'm like, so I've operated in all these different spaces. So if somebody come and ask me about something that I know or connections that I have and I get a good vibe from you and you got good energy and stuff, oh man, I'm, I'm going to help you out. I mean, as long as it's on some legit, some legit stuff, I'm going to help you out. I'm, I'm not trying to get paid off of the stuff because it's taking me a long time to get to where I am. Mm-hmm. And if that means I can cut somebody's time down so they don't have to do all the stuff that I, I've, done, I've done or have to, I've gone through, no, nah, man, I'm gonna believe it. I'm gonna be that blessing because I mean, I rather, I rather you know plant the seed and let it blossom into something else, and I can sit back and enjoy watching you grow into something that's gonna make you successful and more talented. So that's that's so I appreciate what you're doing to say that. No, thank you, thank you, and I appreciate you for spreading that message to the people. You know, um, I'm gonna try to sum it up as much as I possibly can is that the problem with our democratic is that um, <laughs> progress is an uphill battle. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that I don't know about other people, but when I watched the passion of Christ, the Mel Gibson version, mm-hmm. when I was eight, that was the year that I got baptized. And what made me want to do that was, whether you believe that God or Jesus, whether you believe in him at all, but for the people who do, if you believe that God or Jesus is the same person or you believe that it, it, or if you believe that's his son, either way, he sent his son, a perfect man, sent a perfect son to the earth that he created, which was imperfect, to the, fir- the, the very first felony that they say that he committed was when that man's ear got chopped off and he picked his ear off the ground and put his ear back on and healed him mm-hmm. in that very moment. They asked him, was he the son of God? And he said, I am what I told you that I am. And for that, they called him a liar, beat him, ripped his skin, um, jailed him, uh, and then hung him, um, made him carry a cross and hung him on the cross. All for him to say, forgive them, Father, for they not know what they do. Mm -hmm. And um, Jesus and God were both wealthy men. They're the wealthiest men to ever, one, to walk the face of the earth and one to create the earth. So, these are the most famous people in the world. If you think Michael Jackson is famous, they don't have nothing on God. So not to sound religious or spiritual or anything, but to put it in a way to where everything that's in the Bible and everything that's around us spiritually, mentally, physically is all a representation of a full circle. And so if you even look at the Last Supper, the, the most wealthy and most powerful and the most admired man is the man that's on his knees um, washing other people's feet and telling his closest friends, not strangers, but his closest friends, you guys are all going to portray me in a short amount of time from now. And I want all of you to know that don't feel bad about it. I forgive you. You did what you had to do for you. And every last one of them swore up and down that that was not going to be the case. And in a short amount of time, that was definitely the case. So we live on this earth 
where he told us that this stuff was going to continue to repeat itself. So when you want to have a conversation with somebody or you want somebody to help elevate you to another space and they're giving you uh, energy that you did not deserve, that's exactly what God was telling us that the Last Supper was going to happen. So I look at it in a full circle way like that. He made us all flawed. So I can't, I can't harness any malice for the person who doesn't want to see me succeed because they probably, I'm looking at them like they've succeeded and they probably don't even feel like that they successful themselves. And mm -hmm. if they do, they don't know how long they're going to have it. And you don't know what it took for their journey to get there. Maybe nobody helped them and then they developed a permanent disdain for everybody else that's not where they are because they want to get in the door and then close it and lock it. So people have so much other stuff that they're dealing with. And I understand it from that level, especially being somebody that worked their way from the ground up. And like you said, it took a long time and 14 years later got to where I'm at. So I understand why people do want to do it, don't want to do it. I've seen so many unmotivated people that are going to be at the same level that they at right now, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some people like myself and like yourself that want to pay all of these blessings forward. And what we have to do is we have to siphon through all of the people who don't want to pay the blessings forward and not necessarily ask them why they don't want to do it, but acknowledge the fact they don't want to do it, leapfrog them, and then go to the people who do want to do it so that we can phase the people who don't want to do it out. There we go. Right. Now, the work that you're doing, like, how do you see that your work in the entertainment industry and how are you using it in a way to, uh, to give back positively to the, the community? Um, it's kind of like full circle with, with um, what I was just saying. Um, when I hit television, that was one of the proudest moments in the world for me because that's a place that most people are, are always going to be on this side of it instead of being on that side of it. Mm -hmm. So... Now I have the opportunity to, for the rest of my life, to showcase that you can still be like a, just not, I don't even want to say a regular person, but you can still have um, a regular life that you live and you can live it with people interacting with you that may not necessarily even get the opportunities to do the same thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's more important than even putting somebody in a position to do it because when you put them in a position to do it, sometimes it can almost dehumanize them and then it can almost make you feel or them feel like that you're responsible for their failure or their success, which neither one of them is good. So when you make it to a certain plateau and then you operate with people who probably won't make it to that plateau, that's a form of giving back in itself. And I have a friend named Kendra. She has Crohn's disease and she has it really, really bad. And um, when we were talking about the alopecia uh, gala award show, mm -hmm. I actually told, told them that I think that she should be one of the hosts to do it. She doesn't even know that I had that conversation on her behalf. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a huge deal because the, the owner of the Bowden Awards was sitting right next to me when I said it. And he was like, yeah, who's, who's Kendra? And now he's considering honoring her for an award for her um, resilience with the Crohn's disease that she has. So, Continuing to give back in that way, continuing to whoever is running for office, commissioner, senator, governor, president, local, school, PTA, whatever, continuing to take my light that I have and then put that light next to them and go, we have a responsibility to the community. I can't allow you to use these gaslighting terminologies and, and hide behind a desk. We really, I need, to, I need for you to be on the ground and working and holding them accountable and putting my career and myself on the line to make sure that they're held accountable so that the people can have a better tomorrow. So stuff like that, stuff like that. So now what makes you want to put yourself into that spotlight? Because it's, it's one thing to be in the entertainment industry because everything you do is in the entertainment industry but to come down and expose yourself getting into like the nature of politics, because that's, that's like almost like when you want to put a target on your back, mm -hmm. because one thing that you hear people say, I mean, I'm sure you've heard it when uh, like LeBron James, some of the other people speak out against issues. And then, the, you know, the, the right wing people will tell them, you know, stay in your lane, just play some ball and act out your stuff or sing that song like you're supposed to and lead the politics up to the big, the big boys. Mm -hmm. So what makes you want to, so why expose yourself getting into community and, and involvement stuff? Because I, I never felt like any of this was real. I never felt like everything that I did in the industry, industry-wise, was like 
what made me who I am. I feel like it put me in a position to show people how I've always felt behind the scenes and mm-hmm. to, um, to, I tell people all the time that Tupac made good music, but I don't think that he made the greatest music like people say that he made. It was good music. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. So, <laughs> Ain't no so, shade so in him. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And he, you know what I'm saying? I think that it was his revolutionary personality that people bought into and his resilience. So many men ha- either have that and don't showcase it or want to have it, but don't have enough heart and desire to showcase it. And with him, you could tell that whether it was 2020, whether it was 1940, whether it was 1980, that's him. And that's how he's always going to be. Same way, Andrew Tate, same way. That personality type, whatever personality type that is, Dame Dash, Kanye, Tupac, and um, Andrew Tate, all four of them have that same thing within them. And it's like, I call it like the, the ultimate alpha. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, with with that personality trait, people buy into that more. And you, you, you don't feel like that you have a choice. Like sometimes I feel like Kanye want to chill. But because he's Kanye, he, he can't. I feel like sometimes Andrew Tate wants to have a regular conversation without like going on one of those tangents that he goes on. But he can't. That's just him. Tupac probably didn't want to pull over and shoot at them police officers, but he's too be like you know what I'm, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I was so just I, saying, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like Andrew Tate, I think they like it. Like between Andrew, well, Kanye a little different. I really, mm-hmm. I'm one of the people that really believe that Kanye suffers from. I think his mom died. Like he had a mental health like breakdown, and yeah. it like caused him to go up and down. Do I still consider Kanye to be a musical genius? Absolutely, but when it comes to like his personal life and his, well, I do believe in some of his personal belief, but some of the stuff that he does, mm-hmm. uh, Kanye, Kanye, yeah, Kanye, he needs some, he needs prayer and help. And the same yeah. with Andrew Tate. I think Andrew Tate is just, he one of, he is one of the alpha male people. I can't get down with his his own personal belief. I just think that's what he loved doing. I mean, it could all be for show, but I really do think this is what he loves doing. I don't think he ever want to come off of it. Cause I'm it's like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan was an MMA fighter. Mm-hmm. But now Joe Rogan and went so he ain't hard right. He hard right on certain things, but I think he just liked entertainment and just the, the 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 popularity that comes behind it. Like I don't even think he believes some of the stuff he says sometimes. I just think he go with the views that come along with it. No, I feel what you're saying. I think that with all those people that you just talked about having in common is that there's something that the people know them for. Yeah, and no, absolutely. The, yeah, and when the people know them for that then it becomes a hit of dopamine that you get for continuing to deliver that to the people. Right. And I think that that's, that comes full circle to what my answer is too, to where I never wanted to be known as the person who was in the movie or did the TV show or, you know, even when people be like, so you're a content creator. I don't want to be known as that. So you, uh, you, you right. a UGC, I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known for what I do out there because that's what's most important. And then when I'm not here anymore, my kids still have to go out there. Right. So that's that's what's most important. I'll do your movie and I'll do your TV show, but I'm not doing it because I want to be famous. I'm doing it because I want to collect this million dollar check so that I can go build this park, so that I can go build this Boys and Girls Club, so that I can go get those unfurbished homes over there. That's what the bigger picture is. And in order for me to do that, I got to be tapped in with the community. That part of the government owns that land. So I need to be affiliated with them not so I can ask them for permission, but so I can make that phone call and tell them what I'm about to do because I'm about to do it either way. Yeah. And I'm sorry for your friend too, man. I had Crohn's disease and, you know, thank God I'm, I've recovered from it. My stuff been in recession since I was 21. I think the last time I had a checkup, it was, I was 21 and it's, it's been gone since then. But I know that feeling and my heart goes out to her because it is not the most comfortable thing to even have. Yeah. That's a blessing, man. I need I need to connect both of y'all and, and set that up so y'all can have that conversation. I think that people really need to be more, more aware of what that is. And um, you know, I think that your words would definitely be uh positive uh words for her. Yeah, because I had mine, I didn't even know I had it until I was what was I, 17, 16, 17, when I had a I had appendicitis. So when I went in, because my appendix burst, so when I went into in my appendix burst, they discovered that I had the uh, polyps and stuff in the ulcers in my colon. And that's when it was, they diagnosed me with Crohn's disease. 
And so I'm like, especially as a man, <laughs> I was like, I don't wish that on nobody. The, the probing and prodding, and I don't even th- think it was as heavily known because I'm 45 back mm-hmm. then. So I was in a doctor's office three to four times a week. Mm-hmm. And I was doing colonoscopies about once a month mm-hmm. just for them to keep checking on the progress of it. And like I said, I'm going in getting, uh, I ain't even going to need to detail behind it, getting checked out. I'm going to put it like that. Just getting violated three times a week. Just imagine like that, getting violated three times a week. Like I've, I've, I've lost my virginity. Get, I was getting violated three times a week. That's why I was like, I, my heart goes out to anybody that's dealing with Crohn's disease or irritable bowel syndrome. I mean, it's it's a hard thing to go through. I don't think people even realize how bad it is. It's because you can't have dairy products. Like, you can't have no spicy foods. Like, you really got to be strict on your diet. Now, one thing I will say I'm glad about how far they, we've come with, like, medical treatment for, I was taking, like, 15 pills a day. Like, I literally had a bucket of pills to try to keep myself under control and I had to take this up every single freaking day, pop up drinking and sure, because I never could gain any weight. And so I had to deal with that. And it was about a good three or four years before. I don't know. I changed my, I just changed my, my eating habits and everything before I got, before God delivered me from it. And I, I could only get it to him because when I went for my last checkup, they found no ulcers, no nothing in my colon. And it was like, we don't, if they said, we didn't know that we came here looking for, you know, Crohn's or ulcers. Uh, you know, we wouldn't believe it because ain't nothing in there. Man, that's a blessing. Is this your first time sharing the story on this platform? Uh, yeah, Crohn, yeah, in detail, yeah, yeah, in detail. That's dope, man. That ain't nothing but God right there for sure. Yeah, it's like I said, I've been through a lot. And that's why I'm like my heart. That's why when I want to, what I want to be known for is not being a content creator. It's not somebody that's being an activist. I just want to be known as the voice of the people. Only thing I want to do is make sure that I help people out, drop knowledge so they can be aware of, of their surroundings and how to proceed forward and the stuff that they're doing and how they can make a change in their own personal community. That's the only thing I want to be known for. When I leave this earth, that's how I feel as though I want Antonio Hicks to be known and people's coming out of people's mouths is that he was always an advocate for us. He never shied away from the truth and he never backed down from a fight. And so when it comes to helping people out, especially when it comes to, because I was homeless before too, comes to homelessness or dealing with like diseases and stuff like that. No, nah, I've been there done losing, losing a kid. I've been there, done that. And anybody's going through it, my heart always goes out to them and try to do everything I can to pray for them to make sure they can overcome their challenges too. And then be an asset as much as I can. Yeah. Sound like we got a similar mission. Um, yeah, man. I don't. Yeah. I am. It's that's why the politics, that's why the political people don't like me. Cause I don't care about speaking. I'm that's why they could hurt me because I never cared about telling the truth because my, my thing was, if you're not doing anything to help the people, why are you even in office? Oh, you in there for your own aspirations. Well, I'm not yeah. here for my own aspirations. Cause I'm, I'm trying to help people out. I'm like, I'm tired yeah. of seeing people suffer. I'm like, I'm tired. Cause I'm, I'm born and raised here. I mean, even coming from Flint, Michigan, where you come from, it's not like the most affluent town. <laughs> so it's like hey, me growing up here, I saw what it was, what is his peak. And then what it was at the bottom. And if you've been in an office when it was up at its peak, and you still in office when it's at the bottom means you tell it's telling me that you really weren't doing nothing or you have not doing or you're not doing anything to make any type of change within the community. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in 100 percent agreement. Uh, um yeah, what the hell was I just about to say? It was in tangent what you were just saying. Uh yes, to holding the people accountable. That's an office. Um, huge mission. I did a, a interview with a man that was blind. And he had his glasses off. I didn't even know he was blind until halfway through the interview when I tried to shake his hand and he just moved it to like the middle of the table and I had to move my hand to his hand. Mm. And I was like, oh, he must be blind. And I seen the person adjust the microphone in front of his face. I said, oh, he is blind. And then we started talking about it and he was very open and transparent about it. And now I'm in the process of helping him uh, get a few awards and also uh, host a few things himself and help him with his brand. So I, I, I got a, I got a soft spot for stuff like that too. And he told me that he wrote an essay where his teacher told asked him, "What is it that you want to be, and what are some things that you wish that you had?" Mm-hmm. And he didn't put vision on his paper. And his teacher almost gave him an F for that because his teacher just assumed that he was going to say that he wanted to see, mm-hmm. and that's that's not something that he wanted to do. If I call him on the on the phone right now, he'll pick up. 
He can take himself to the bus stop. Like, it's just a bunch of stuff that he can just function regularly in reality. And to me, it's always outstanding to see it when I actually see it in person and, and, and um, other people with disabilities. When I was, when I was there at, at the same place, there were people that were like in the, in the wheelchair, the ones that could actually push it. And then the ones that operated with the button, the ones that operate where they can blow through the thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are so many people that are unaware of the different things that people wake up and challenges that people wake up and do every single day and not by choice. Right. And, and they, and they push through when people undermine what the dating market is like for them and people undermine what regular life is every day for them. I'm pretty sure that they are, some of them are probably more on suicide watch than others because they're like, I don't see a reason for me to keep going, especially when I'm in this predicament and right. why be religious if God put me in this predicament. So now they can't even have a relationship with God. And then you have the ones on the other side where it's like, Hey, listen, with all of this stuff that's that people say is wrong with me, I'm still breathing. Mm -hmm. And that's all. That's all I need for me to be able to push through the day. And then they become advocates and create nonprofits for their own, uh, what, the, what people will call disabilities. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to put the wrong terminology out there. But for whatever they, that, whatever they're dealing with, with how, whatever circumstance they wake up with. So I'm becoming more versed in that right now. I'm actually up for the community activist award with the front, with the gala, and um, I spoke to the president this morning. And I told her. Um, just put that on ice right quick because I, it's a few more things that I want to do in the community so that I could really, really earn that award for real. And I got to, I got to make a stamp and, and do something that's monumental for the people that are dealing with what they're dealing with so that people know long, long after this, I want people bothering my son when he comes to this earth at whatever point he comes, like, you know, your dad was real heavy into this, like what you about to do to the point where he ain't got no choice but to do it and his son and his son and my daughter and her daughter and her daughter and just keep that going. Mm -hmm. Now I'm telling you now, I mean, <laughs> they, don't be surprised if they don't pick up that mantle like you because my kids, well, I don't know what they're going to do when they get older because they didn't even, like I, I was thinking like one of my boys, I have two boys and they're both from okay. college. I was thinking one of them will uh, become an engineer neither one of them become engineers and I'm not mad at it. I mean, they're both successful in everything they're doing. I'm happy for I'm proud of both of my boys. But I don't like they've been around me and they could they actually came out. We did some protests and stuff together. But I'm like, I asked one of them, both of them, I was like, Y'all think y'all ever get into politics? And it was like, hell no. <laughs> it was like, we've seen what you went through. It was like, no. Yeah. yeah. That's what that, yeah. And that's smart. You know, but just like what you said earlier, life is politics. Yeah. And when, once is. you learn how, once you learn how to operate life. Because when I tell people all the time that when I when I start talking to the commissioner and the governor and the senator and they're like, OK, so so what office are you running for? None. So what? how are you versed in politics? I'm not. But what you got to understand about politics is just they have a title in office mm -hmm. and they had people that were uh, fundraising around them. Me, I have my own title, my own office and I have my own funding. So what I've done is become a parallel. And when people, what people got to realize is that that's what life is. Life is about positioning yourself in a parallel. Mm -hmm. Oh, I figured out what I was going to ask you earlier. Okay. This is what I was going to ask you. So being 45 and then also having two kids and then also you said you, you were divorced, right? Yep. Okay. So I wanted to know, based off of that journey, there's a lot of men that come to me to ask me for advice. I'm 29. So I think that this would probably be a better suited question for you. Mm -hmm. is in your 45 years of life, what are the most important things that you've learned about being a man that you would tell a man that's 18 years old right now? Um, know yourself. Know yourself and know your worth. Like, I think that's the most important thing that anybody can learn nowadays. Because if you know yourself and you know what your worth is, then nobody can take advantage of you. And I think we all fall short when it comes to stuff like that, because we're always trying to appease somebody, even the most hardest of hardest man. He always is trying to appease somebody. I don't care if it's trying to pursue a career because that could be his master or trying to find some kind of success that could be his master or mm -hmm. trying to climb his way up in a corporate job that could be his master or his business that could be his master. Know yourself and know your worth, because if you know yourself and you know your worth, then you have the love that comes in behind that. Because if you know all those things, then you know what you love, you know who you love, and you know how to love them and how to love them well. Because the one thing that you don't want to do, and like I, I tell my boys all the time, we always had life lessons coming up. And it was one of the things I always taught them too was like for every action, there's a reaction. And it's depending upon your actions, 
that you do, it could depend upon the outcome of that action, be it good or be it bad. And I don't want anybody to ever grow up having doubt or regret of something they wish they can go back and change if somebody gave them the foresight of knowing about it ahead of time. So if you know about, if you know who you are, as an, I'm going to give you one clean example, like what I have regrets for in my life, about, which I should have knew who my, my worth was. So if I had known at the time what my worth was when I was working and climbing up the corporate ladder, when I first got into, uh, into corporate America in, in 1999, I would have known not to allow a job to dictate my life and my schedule. And that I didn't have to, you don't have to work hard to show yourself off to somebody because if you're doing a good job and you're showing you showing you're doing a good job for yourself, then the light that you're putting out from the hard work you're doing for yourself, people that are supposed to be around you and see that they'll give you that promotion or that blessing, they're going to be hard. They're going to be attracted to you. But me, I was forcing it because I'm trying to do what they say you're supposed to do and play all the games and spending all my hours away from home. So much so mm-hmm. that I miss out on time with my kids. And that's I miss out on time with my youngest son who passed away. So I'm like, I don't want anybody to ever have to go through something of that sort. Cause it could, it don't have to be a child. It could be a parent. It could be a loved one. It could be somebody they're close to. Cause time is one of the most precious things that we have here. And time is something that you can never get back. So once you spend that time out there, you got to make sure that you're getting a good return of investment on it because you will never see it again. You will never, I don't care how hard you work. The biggest thing that you have here, the big, biggest commodity that you have in your possession is time itself. And if you spend that time doing something that might not necessarily give you the outcome that you want and you missed it, being uh, having somebody else spend time with you or build a relationship with you, you're going to regret it later on in life. And that's one of the biggest regrets that I had. I didn't spend more time with my youngest son before he passed away. And that's why I would tell any man, know yourself and know your worth. And my condolences, too. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Do um do you feel like that the divorce from your wife was the better decision or was it something that was kind of like a pushed into a corner decision? Um, it was the better decision because at the time she um she came from a broken household. Like she had loving parents to a degree, but her parents weren't married. And so she never knew what it was to what well, is what she told me. She because she left me I, like I didn't call for the divorce. She called for the divorce. She never knew what it was to love somebody. So she ultimately ended up falling out of love with me. And then once we had lost everything that we had and had to move back in with my parents for a little bit, that safety net wasn't there anymore, which is what kept her around, which is why I think God put all that in place because technically we was, we was married on a lie because she was comfortable and she didn't, she had, she was a stay at home mom. So she didn't really have her skill set up to a degree because she had been at home with kids for like, I think my, my oldest son at the time was three years old, three years. So mm-hmm. she felt as though that because that safety net was there, she couldn't just leave because it's like, where would she go? Cause she's not in corporate anymore. But then mm-hmm. once it was gone, yeah, now she can go and face her true truths and tell me what it was. And then, you know, call for the divorce. Was that y'all plan when y'all had y'all first kid was for her to become a stay at home wife? Like, did y'all know going into the marriage that oh, that wasn't the plan? No, nah, it wasn't the plan. No, nah, it's not. Nah. Huh? I said, how did it fall into that? The cost of living, man. So it was so. What was it at the time? She had got laid off from her job, too. So she worked in IT, too, for a, a long time. And she, matter of fact, she was getting paid a little bit more than me. But. She had lost her job. They had a surplus and she had lost her job. And at that time, when she had started working again, she was working somewhere else. Daycare was expensive as hell, which daycare is still expensive as hell right now. So daycare back then, you're talking about this is 2001. Putting a mm-hmm. newborn in daycare, it was costing us just one child. It was $1,200, $1,300 a month. And this is $2,001. <laughs> it's two thousand one dollars. So it's like, and I hear it's the same thing nowadays. Now I think it's like fifteen hundred to almost two thousand dollars for a newborn for one kid in daycare. So when she was working, it was like all of her money that she was working toward working was going towards childcare because we had two kids. Mm-hmm. So she decided to stay at home, and then once they got old enough, she picked up a part time job working up at Starbucks to like feed into her habit. Which I mean, I can be in that because everybody likes Starbucks. This is when Starbucks really was crunk back then. When Starbucks still is crunk now, but. She, it was when like it was really popping. So she picked up a part-time job working at Starbucks to 
pay for a Starbucks habit. And then, of course, I bring the boys up there to get drinks and stuff, too. So now, now when you date, are you are you uh, mostly L- LT- LTR or are you looking to get married again? Oh, I'm, I'm married again. That's what I said, my wife. My current wife is in the music, I mean, in the movie industry. Oh, okay, got you. Oh, you know, you did say that earlier. I I, I didn't know whether you were talking about her from back then or your nah, current wife. No. Nah. Okay. Yeah, my, my former wife, she worked in IT. My current wife, she worked in supply. She's a supply chain analyst, but she was an actress trying to get into acting before she got into supply chain. That didn't go. So she, it didn't go the way she wanted to go initially. So she would start working the regular nine to five. And then when COVID hit, she wanted to branch back out and get back into the industry again. So she started learning about other stuff that she can do besides acting. And she got like supply, not supply, just a script supervisor. So she became a script supervisor. No, nah, that's cold, man. Sound like that you, um, you landed on your feet well after the divorce. That's usually, especially when kids are involved and then somebody was a stay at home parent. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming that she tried to clean you out. Am I wrong? It went under clean out. No, no, we had a good relationship. Like we still, we friends now. Like, it, I mean, of course it took a couple of years, but no, we, yeah, we're really good friends now. So it, I mean, it wasn't nothing clean out because it wasn't nothing there. Like we literally lost everything that we had because I stopped working in my uh, previous job. And of course it was during a recession because were you old enough? No, you weren't old enough back then. This was during the recession back in 2007. So it was far worse than what we have been going on like this past couple of years. Even worse than, no, it wasn't worse than the pandemic layoff. But yeah, there was no recovery from that. And so me trying to get back and do a corporate work, nobody wasn't hiring. So we ended up losing like everything. So we moved, that's why I moved back in with my parents because her family's not down. Her family, this, this is one of some Saginaw, Michigan. Mm-hmm. So no, I had some, no, I, I had my good, I had, Five years, six years. I hated women. Oh man, okay. I now now we're getting there. Okay. Yeah, no, I was no, yeah, I'm not gonna say, yeah, I would never sugarcoat that. Mm-mm, no, I I because it was like because I consider myself to be uh, I well back well, I mean I still am now, but I was considered myself to be a good because I'm I mean I'm quiet. Mm-hmm. And it's like I got into even before we got divorced, I mean, I was still doing um, community service work, but I still was like a, a stay at home dad. Like I, I really stayed at home. I didn't like running the streets enough. I like I love being around my. Fa- I love being a family man. Like I love yeah, being a family man. Yeah, yeah. And so when that didn't work, and she left, and then she left, and, t- and to me, when she told me that she had fallen out of love with me, and she kind of had me hiding from me. All oh, that set me off because I'm like, man, here I am, busting my ass trying to spoil you, give you everything that you wanted. Like, it was, it was even one thing. Now, this is how y'all know y'all got somebody good. Like, I did that. I would be considered a... Well, I mean, I was simple for my wife. So, it was yeah. Valentine's Day. And she had always wanted, like, this new... The brand... The Beetle had just came out. The brand new revamped Beetle had just came out. Mm-hmm. And she had wanted to... Uh, she wanted a new convertible Beetle. And I forgot what she was driving. She had been driving a Wrangler. And then she had dropped down to something else, but she had we, the beetle came out, and she thought she she saw, she actually wanted the beetle. So for Valentine's Day, we had went out to dinner one day, and I was like, I had already went to the car dealership and everything, and I was like, well, you want? Um, I said, let's go, go go somewhere before we go back home. So she was like, okay. So we ended up going to the dealership. I bought her a brand new beetle on Valentine's Day. So I'm doing all this stuff to be because you say how are you supposed to be a good man, taking care of my house. Like we had a brand new house and stuff making sure that she, you know, she had everything that she wanted. And then, you know, I, once everything is gone and you leave me, it's almost like you kick me when I'm on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And so when she left and I'm like, I'm left there to fend for myself. This is when I became homeless because my, my family thought that I wanted to run the streets. And I was like, y'all not, y'all know y'all ain't never seen me get out of run no goddamn streets. I'm like, I am not no club person. <laughs> like I'm like, I'm a, cause I was an IT guy. I'm still an IT guy. I'm like, I was an IT nerd. I'm like, I just, I like to do my job, stay in my corner, mind my business. And that's it. I didn't spend a whole bunch. It's the only time I was out around a bunch of people was not doing community service work. When I wasn't doing community service work and doing mentoring stuff, I was at home. So, yeah, my family, they kicked me out. They thought I wanted to um, when she left because they thought I was the one ruining the marriage and I wanted to go be with other people. And I was like, hell no, that's not even me. And that's when I became homeless. So when I became homeless and then all this stuff happened at the same time. And of course, it's like a year or two after my son had passed away. Man, I couldn't. I hated women. Like I hated women. Yeah, it sounded like that was the ultimate rock bottom with everything right there. Mm-hmm. It was. Yeah, yeah. I went through suicidal thoughts and everything. 
Yeah, it was it was terrible. Like the only so thing that, the, the only thing that killed me from being on the streets, I had one of my managers. He um he had moved and he had offered to let me come sleep on his floor. So I slept on this man's floor for two years. Mm. That was a real offer. It yeah, it was. I mean, because if he didn't offer it, I would have been on the streets. I would have been one of the people that y'all sitting out on this, these benches now on the streets. And I still worked. I worked to make sure my kids were taken care of. That's one thing nobody can ever get me on either. I was not a deadbeat dad. Even though we got a divorce, I was not a day. I made sure my boys were taking it. There was nothing my kids did not want that they did not get. They did not know that at the time that we was poor. They, mm-hmm. I mean, they knew to a degree that we didn't have the money that we had before. But whenever it came for clothes, whenever it came for shoes, I don't care what shoes it was. When, I don't care what they asked for. I don't care if it was video game stuff. I don't care what it was. I found a way and I made it happen for them. And I did all this three states away because she went back to Michigan. And she took them with her? She took him with him here. Yep. Okay. So did y'all ever, did you ever get involved with the child support system? No, I, we didn't have to. Like we, I told her, I mean, I, I started paying her from day one. And every time I, I actually did just talk about this recently on, um, it wasn't a podcast episode. I was just talking about, cause I got tired of people complaining about um, the child support and me and having to take care of the responsibilities. No, nah, whenever I got increased, I always increased my child support. And it wasn't even, and I hate to call it child support. I just say taking care of my kids because I wasn't under a government funded system telling me to take care of my kids. I sent money to take care of my children because one thing I would, and then I protected her too on top of that. Because we end up making up a year and a half after divorce. I think it was two years after divorce. Like I was still angry, but I wouldn't, I I let it go because I I still got the same mindset now. I don't want to see anything happen to her or upset her because if anything had happened to her, it will ultimately affect my boys. Mm-hmm. And one thing I did not want to do was have some more sorry men in this world. Right. So I made sure that whatever she needed or whatever they needed, she had it. And yeah. I mean, that's, that's how we operated. I never, so we end up, you know, we end up getting cool again and I forgave her. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, my boys, they've been taken care of. And I mean, it shows. My boys were honor students. My boys, they were in the IB program. Like I, like I wrote, wrote about this. Well, I talked about this. The International Baccalaureate Program, one of the highest things you can get into in high school to prepare you for college, get college credits. They were all had IB classes and AP classes. They graduated with honors, played music, played sports. Both of my kids got into the schools they want to get into, and they're still doing well now. And I did all of this three states away. We prayed every single morning, Going to school, we went over affirmations. Going to school, we went over homework assignments. I mean, they weren't perfect. No kids are perfect. Like we, yeah, I mean, right. they still messed up on stuff. But when they came to my three rules in my house, which was they had to be good at, they had to be exceptional at uh, music, sports, and uh, education. I'm like, you ain't got to be the best athlete, but you got to play sports because you got to know about teamwork. You got to learn about leadership. Mm-hmm. I'm like, when you play, do music. The only reason I'm telling you to play music is to broaden your horizons, to work on your artistic side to keep you, uh, your mind sharp. And then education, because you got to have a foundation behind anything that you, you got to have something that you got to build it on top of. Both of my boys did. I mean, they were, both of them played the viola and one went to violin, the other went to French horn. And my other son, my youngest son, when it was in marching band playing the French horn. So, not. and then my oldest son, he could play, I mean, it was multiverse because he could play the piano. So he played the piano, the violin, and then, like I said, the viola. And my youngest played the vi- viola, the French horn, and then acoustic guitar. So when people yeah. tell me I have a hard time with men, because I got friends now, like my wife's friend, I have friends mm-hmm. now that they have, you know, fathers that are in the States, their kids' fathers in the States, and they have a hard time being around them. And I'm like, that's some bullshit. Because if I right. can do it three states away and I drove up to Michigan three to four times a year to see my boys and bring them down here, if you telling me you can't even see your kid and he live in the same state as you, you don't want to yeah. be around your kid. You a, you a deadbeat. You are the perfect person to have this conversation with. You are the perfect person. And I think that um, I think that you should speak more on a solo level. And I think that that'd be a really good lane for you to go up to talk to the women who are dealing with men who don't want to be there for their children. And also the, ch- the men who feel that their wife or a girlfriend or a baby mom, whatever they want to classify her as, is keeping the children away so that you can be the person to specify what that is. You get what I'm saying? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
And not all relationships are perfect. I mean, because I'm not going to sit here and say that ours isn't unique. Because even when I went to Michigan, like I would stay in her place and she would go stay in her boyfriend's place so I could be around my boys. And not everybody is going to agree with that. Because I mean, my, own, my wife at the time, she didn't necessarily agree with that until she came up with me one day and saw what nothing going I was not trying to sleep with my ex-wife. And I know a lot of right. men have a hard time trying to separate themselves from that. I'm like, I mm-hmm. was not trying to sleep with my ex-wife. I was trying to see my kids. And that's exactly what I did. I went up there and saw my boys, stayed there a week, and I came right on back home. That's that's a different level of maturity. You know, I I remember when I was on the set of Step Up and I met my guy, Ralph, and um, I was sitting on the side and Ralph came over there and he was like, hey, what's good, Russell? What's up? It was our first time meeting. And we started chopping it down with each other and he started going, I just met that little girl over there, man. I'm about to do this. I'm about to take her here, do this, do that. I said, oh, you talking about such and such? Man, all you got to do is do this, 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 and then she'll let you hit. And then he said, what about that girl over there? I said, oh, her, just do this, 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 and this, and she'll let you hit. And then he said, so you know about all of these girls on set? And I said, pretty much. And he said, so where's your girl at? I said, she is right there. And she was on the dance floor dancing with uh, with another dude. Mm-hmm. And she was like, damn, but you're not tripping about her dancing with that other dude? I said, man, that's such and such. That's like added security. Like, <laughs> that's like my brother. That's like her brother. Ain't nothing going on with that. And then he looked around and he saw that I had control over the whole room from sitting over there. And I said, the only the only way you can have control over this whole room is to allow everybody to have freedom. Yeah. And I think that that's a huge um, proponent, especially in our demographic, but just people in general, is that they have so many insecurities that they feel that their control is like a mask for their insecurity when mm-hmm. freedom is the true is the really the only gateway for the truth to be able to live in its purest state in a hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get the idea of control because the harder you try to control something, the harder it's going to be for you and more stressful it's going to be for you. Mm-hmm. But when you let something go, I mean, now you don't, you got the freedom not to have to worry about anything anymore. Yeah. 100%. Have you tapped in with Mr. Lego yet? Uh uh-uh. uh. You know who that is? I don't know. You know who that is? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay, I'll bridge the gap for you. I just did my 20 verses uh-huh. and he the liaison for the wisdom portion of the 20 verses. Okay. You yeah, you are familiar with those, all right? Uh huh. Okay. So I think that'd be a really good connection for you too. And then I'll continue to send more people that are in this. I don't even know what the hell to call this community that we have now, but what, what do you call it? What are we talking about now? Just in general, like the the I, some people call it the manosphere. Um, I don't like I don't like calling it the red pill community because I don't consider myself to be a red pill content. Yeah, I'm not creator. a red pill. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't know what to call it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have no because I mean I'm yeah I'm older than everybody. I would be, this is before I existed before this whole red pill, blue pill conversation stuff is. I'm just a man. That's the only thing I know. I'm just a man who, who had a family I took care of and I still take care of to this day. And mm-hmm. I value the respect of my boys and the respect of the women that's around me. I value the respect of my wife. I value the respect of my kids' mom. I mean, I make sure everybody's taken care of. So what, I don't uh, flag, what flag is that behind you? Oh, that's a Palestinian flag. Wait, oh, it is? Yeah. Give me, give me a little bit of history on that. So, oh, you thought it was um, the black, the the African American flag? Uh, well, I didn't really have a a, a pre a preconceived notion of it because it's kind of like going like this, so I yeah. didn't know what it was. But I knew it was a flag, though. So, yeah, I'm one of the people that I'm. I've been real vocal about the atrocities taking place across the world. I mean, I'm because I'm I'm for the people. So, mm-hmm. from the the Congolese to the um, the Uyghurs over in China to the uh who are the other muslims that was being uh, that was being taught by the buddhists in other countries and then palestinian always the palestinians and then like some of the ukrainian people but yeah pa- palestine so i've been knew about congo for a long time before i even get on palestine so congo is what i mean like we uh, i made an episode on it now I was talking about where all the medals that we have around here now even though they just found some precious medals here in the u.s the metals that we have to make all of our technology and that we're talking on, we're using to, on these devices right now come from Africa. 
Right. So the African people have always been exploited and they've still been exploited by the Chinese people. So I'm like, so we've been, they've suffered genocide over the fall. I mean, they've lost over 10 to 11 million over right now working in these mines and then us feeding off into these military forces out there to try to kill these people off and control them to make sure they go down and, and mine this stuff out, these materials out, these precious metals out for little to nothing and not even feeding them. And if they dare to even say anything, they get killed. So my heart has always gone out to, because I mean, we are people that's been oppressed for how long? And that's the thing I don't understand when it comes to us, when we are against other countries and yeah. how they're oppressing their people, because people say, well, what we got to do with Palestine? I'm like, well, even if you don't care about this Palestinian people, you should care about where your money's being spent at. Because if your money's not being spent towards you, and I'm an advocate for this too. If the person, in the, if, if you aren't taking care of your house, but you funded somebody else's house, we, have, we, we are already out of order. Because you should make sure home is taken care of first before you start taking any care of anybody else's home. So when it comes to Palestine, Palestine has always been there. People can Mm -hmm. argue with me all day long. Palestine has always been there. Whether it was called Palestine or not in history books, Palestine and the Muslim people have always been there. Now, people will argue that the Jews have always been there. But then I'm like, well, if you want to go by biblical sense, I'm like, they kicked them out because they didn't go by the word of God. So I'm like, so when they lost their land and they got disbanded from their land, I'm like, somebody had to come back in and take over. So if you if so if you get evicted from your house and you got to foreclose from your house, you can't turn around and come back to your house unless you're paying for it. Right. So I'm like, so if you want to even go by biblical sense, because well, don't challenge me on the Bible, because I'm like, I grew up, I, I grew up in the church. So I'm like, you want to challenge me on that? I'm gonna tell you straight up, they got kicked out because they disobeyed the word of God, which is how they came from European countries and the English brought them back over there to them. And I, I believe it, and this is a conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. They brought them back over into Palestine to control the Muslim community. And so they could have them a footprint within the Middle East over there because Egypt wouldn't give them any land. Our, our, Iran wasn't giving them any land. None of the Muslim countries was allowing the U.S. to have a presence over inside of them like that. So they was like, OK, well, if we can get the Jewish people down in there and it's part of the Holy Land. Then we can control, them, which is why they end up forcing them along with the U.S., to get a part of the United Nations and had the United Nations allowed them to declare themselves a state. Thus caused the start of the war was in 1946 with the Palestinian people. Now they consider the Palestinians started first, but I'm like, who would have started first? If you're in my house and you're <laughs> going to tell me inside of my house that uh-huh. you now take part ownership of my house. No, I'm going to kick you the hell out of my house. Yeah. Plain and simple. You might not like the theory of that, but if you want to go by biblical sense, that's exactly what happened. And even if, and then, okay, if you don't want to go by biblical sense, that means you invaded somebody else's land and you colonized in somebody else's land. So one of the two things, no matter what you go by, you're still in the wrong. So I'm like, yeah. so yeah, they still, that's why they're going to fight you because you're on, on, you're on, on stolen land. It's no difference if the Native Americans here and the Africans, because Africans here would, with the Native Americans, they started fighting the U.S. government. Can you get mad at them? I mean, they committed genocide. <laughs> I'm not going to be mad if the Native Americans all of a sudden decided one day they want to start executing people in the government and taking on the military. As long as they don't come and kill me, I'm like, I'll come back because I will understand what the U.S. at the time did to them and their people and their ancestors. So do I think it's right what's going on in Palestine? I don't. I don't. And I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat it. I don't. And I'm like, I've seen you know, this other thing I argue with people about. I'm like, I've been to Israel. I have Jewish friends over in Israel. Am I saying all Jewish people are bad? I'm not saying all Jewish people are bad. Just like I don't say all white people are bad. But do I think they have a group of oppressors over there, colonizers, the right-wing government? Absolutely. The same as we have these militias here, and we have right-wing people here that want to see black people gone. And I have seen firsthand with my eyes how they treat black Ethiopian Jews over there. They treat them like trash. They say they're less than. Don't even allow them to get benefits of the regular Jewish people. So I'm like, so if you want to argue with me about something, don't argue with me on something that I know and I've seen with my own eyes firsthand. And so when I tell people that, they, they, they get quiet. I said, like, you can't tell me how something is when I've been over there and I saw it in my eyes. If you have not been over to Israel and inquired about it, because you can go to Jerusalem and other places and see the good side of, of uh, Israel and not be exposed to the Ethiopians over there or the black people. You can. It's a beautiful country. Food is some of the best food I've had in the world. And I've traveled to a bunch of places. It is the best food I have had. That's a but, big statement. Huh? That's a big statement. Oh, it is. Oh, it's seasoned up well. It, okay. it seasoned up very well. And that's all I'm like. So, but me, I'm a history person. Shout out to Miss Scott. God rest her soul. She passed away. She made me understand history and she made me know what I had to learn about where I came from. Learn this in when I was, I was, yeah, junior in high school. 
and she made me learn about history because I was not a history person. But the minute I graduated mm-hmm. high school, I became big on history. So now when I go to different countries, I don't want to see tourist stuff. I want to learn about the culture. I want to learn about the people. I want to see where the people come from. I want to see their their artifacts. I want to see all of this historic stuff that's over there. And then once I see all that stuff, I'm going to go and have some fun. I'm going to be a tourist then. So when I mm-hmm. went over there, I'm like, hey, man, well, where where the black folks at? Where the Ethiopians at? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, oh no, you don't want to go around them. They're uneducated. They're uncouth. They're on. Un- they're classless mm-hmm. people. And I was like, I know I'm light skinned, but you know I'm black, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, you saying that, and my wife is right here, and she's chocolate. So I'm like, you know, but no, you're different. You're an American. Yeah. So yeah, I, I rock with mm-hmm. Palestine. I'm going to always rock with Palestine. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, not saying it. execute all Jewish people. I'm not saying it at all. I love my Jewish brothers and sisters over there. There's some good people. There's some real good people, which is why they out there fighting and they're getting arrested now, protesting Netanyahu. They are. But do I think they're in the right? No, they're not. And do I think America, America could, should stop funding them? Absolutely. I mean, because they got benefits that we don't even have. Like they have subsidized education. They pay for their child care. They take maternity leave. They pay for men and women to have maternity leave once they, they give birth. They pay That's for child care. I mean, they give them everything that we wish as Americans we could have over here, but they tell us that we're not a socialist country and we can't get those things. But I'm like, your money is paying for these people over here to have those same benefits that we wish that we could have. Yeah, it don't make no sense. No. So that's no. why. And I saw that because this was at the heat of the whole war. And I was at my son's school and one of the young ladies up there, which, in, which I like to see when, when students get involved. She was mm-hmm. I participated in one of the protests in downtown Atlanta and I asked her about it. And then she was like, she kind of looked at me sideways. I was like, love. I was like, I, I mean, I keep my eyes open and my, my ears to the streets. <laughs> I was like, just because my kid go up to the school, I was like, I know what's going on. And she says, You want a flag? I was like, Yeah, give me a flag. I'll take one. Oh, that's the one right there. Yeah, that's the one I, I keep back there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this would be a perfect conversation, like in depth, in depth with you and Dr. Omar and with you and Nick Cannon. That'd be a dope-ass conversation right there. Yeah, I would do it, but he, uh, <laughs> Dr. Omar, he said, don't worry about him. He said, worry about, him. and I understand why he would say that to a degree, but I'm like, I can still worry about one house and worry about another house at the same time, too, because he said, well, think about the people, the Congolese and what's going on in Africa, and I'm like, I agree with that, but I'm like, it's been going on for a long time. Now. That's not anything new. But I mean, what the same thing as Palestine. It's been going on for a long time, too. So both of them have been going on for a very long time. It's just gotten yeah. a lot worse. Right, right. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a weird space to be in. I just did my genealogy test three or four days ago, mm-hmm. and I just figured out that I'm Igbo Nigerian. So that would, consider, that would be considered my house, and I would be considered a foreigner on this land, even though I have a citizenship here. So it creates a lot of gray areas. Yeah. So... I think that Dr. Omar doesn't acknowledge sometimes that there's a lot of great areas with certain things within our genealogy, regardless of whether our ancestors were kidnapped, molested or not. We have a homeland. Some of us are indigenous. Some of us are not. And if a person is indigenous here, then they don't have any African roots. So when you wear dashikis and you wear a kufi, that doesn't resonate with them because they're Native American. So right. we can probably have it. I can be darker than you and still be indigenous here. So mm-hmm. I think that he just has to acknowledge more of those gray areas. Yeah. Yeah. I so, think, um, gonna, go ahead. I was going to say, oh, no, this has been a great conversation, man. I appreciate you. No, man. So, I mean, what, so with the stuff that you're doing, like what are the, some of the projects that you want to work on, like in the community engagement? Uh, right now, me and Commissioner Ted Terry are about to do a, a tiny home development. I just got him in contact with a few developers and a few contractors who one of them is a, a African-American com- a woman company owned and African-American male company owned. And so and Ted, Ted Terry is Caucasian and he is 110 percent for the cause. He's one of those proactive and progressive um, political figures. And even with my genealogy test that I just did with me being 29, I haven't known where my roots led for 29 years. And Mm -hmm. I think that we're the only race in the world that lives with that every single day, not knowing where our people live and having to get over the fact that most of our people were kidnapped. And even with me um, learning that I'm Igbo, I I, I just, um, I've been doing my homework and 
I actually come from the group of people who in uh, 1803 held hands and walked to the bottom of the ocean and said that they would rather die in the bottom of this ocean than to be uh, slaves over in America. And a lot of people don't know that lineage. So we've been dealing with this shit for forever. Mm-hmm. And even though I'm here, it still hasn't changed. It's just people do it with suits on now. So now what I'm encouraging with all of the genealogy um companies and shout out to the ones that have reached out so far to give me free kits and affiliate links so that I can make it affordable for all of the other people. I'm going to say African-American, but I'm not going to limit it to African-Americans. So for anybody that wants to figure out what you are so you can get more connected with your roots, I think a lot of us want to go back to Africa. But if we don't know where we come from in Africa, then we ain't got no place to go. We're just a tourist in our homeland, which yep. what's more confusing than that? If you in your own house and your key don't work in your own house, that's confusing. Yep. So now I want to give people a place. Now I know when I go to uh, to Africa, I need to go to Iboland, Nigeria, and I need to get property there because this is where my people hail from. And I know that um, this is what my lineage is. And when I get hit there and I, I see the climate, I'm going to understand why my skin is reacting like this. And people are going to be able to tell me different things that resonate with me that I would never be able to get. I'm, we, me and you, more than likely, are speaking a native tongue that is not ours. Right. And this uh, indoctrination that we have to get back in touch with, um, with, with our roots. And, but also at the same time, what makes us special is that we have been able to um, survive within this different climate here in America and still be what we are in our roots and still reconnect with our roots. And so essentially we're an accidental expansion if you look at it in that way. Yeah. So one thing that they can never do, they've always tried to do is kill us off. And that's one thing that that, that can never happen. No. I mean, I tell you people all the time, like we, when they... <laughs> When I hear folks say that they're being oppressed, I was like, nobody is more oppressed than black people. Mm-hmm. And that's across this world. Nobody is more oppressed than black people across this world. And that's, I mean, I'm talking about from Australia to South America to China. And nobody is more oppressed than black people. Mexico, India, black people get persecuted everywhere they are and where, everywhere they're in existence. And we don't even get any reparations from it either. We have to exist, code switch, and know how to operate in other people's places just so they don't come and attack us and take us out. Whereas other folks are allowed to exist, practice their own culture without anybody harassing them. And still hope that we don't get killed by each other in the process. Right. So not only do we have to watch our back worried about other folks, we got to watch our back worried about our own people as well, too. Our own people. And that's, oh, yeah. that's what my, um, and that's what my, my, my current um, stances right now as, as far as all that goes. I'm, I'm proud uh, in that moment I did so much research on African garment and so I just might have gone to shopping spree for a whole bunch of um, Nigerian and Ibo garment and I'm about to do I got two tests uh, from different genealogy companies coming on the way for me to confirm that these findings are true. Mm-hmm. African ancestry tell me gen and ancestry I just did 23 and me so I hope that other people are just as proactive about doing it as I am, especially the ones who have no idea, which I had no idea. So I'm I'm happier now. I feel way more clarity. I've been getting in tune with the music. I've been getting in tune with the people and the people uh, have embraced me with open arms. So I appreciate that. And I want I want the same fulfillment for the people who uh, don't know that I got. All right, man. Well, yeah, I appreciate you for coming on, brother. I appreciate you for having me, man. It's been one of my most interesting conversations for sure. <laughs> now, what's uh, what's next for you before we wrap up? Like, what, what do you have going on? Like, immediately or just in, in general? In general. Like, what do you have planned for, like, in, in music or acting? Like, what are you pursuing now next? So, uh, the, the community development for the tiny homes so that we okay. can get real estate back into a good place here in America. But specifically in Georgia, it's crazy right now. Um, we need to do away with these discriminatory loans, these predatory loans, and then also with uh, the discrimination against not being able to get loans as colored people. Um, the genealogy testing, I want to take that to a whole nother level 
And I want to make sure that everybody has the access to be able to figure out what they are in a timely manner and without there being any discrimination as far as that goes as well, too. And we are putting together the uh, Bowden Awards and we're also putting together the Gala Awards. And uh, the Gala Awards is going to be focused on people with alopecia, lupus and cancer. So we're going to make sure that those people are highlighted and that they do have the proper treatment that they need in places where they are given the proper care. So I'm going to be tapping into my humanitarian side um, and, and making it come full circle in the near future. All right. Now, one thing I ask before people get off my show is to leave the uh, community with a word of encouragement, something positive, if you don't mind. You know, if there is one thing that people ask me probably in every show is what I would tell my younger self. Mm-hmm. And if I could go back in time and tell my younger self anything, I would tell my younger self it's coming. Never worry about whether or not God's plan is going to come into fruition. You just worry about what you're going to do when the ball is in your court. Plan for what happens after that blessing that you've been playing for, been praying for is received instead of for the blessing itself. Amen to that. And where can people find you at? Or at Vigilante L O M on everything, everything. In 2025, at the end of 2025, I'm definitely going to be the biggest YouTuber in the world. I can already see it based off of the stuff that I'm doing, and it within the, within the UGC content space. So definitely tap in with that Vigilante Visuals on YouTube and Vigilante L O M on everything else. All right, man. Yeah, I'm gonna pick it back off of that too. I'm like, don't let anything stop you from pursuing the goals that you want uh, that you're trying to achieve. Only thing it takes for you to do is just open the door and step out. Like if it. you want to get something done, all you got to do is just unlock that door and step out in it and then let God handle the rest of it. Because you already took the step of actually moving in place and move, putting the works into action. As long as you have the faith behind it and the trust that it's going to be OK, you will achieve anything that you set your mind towards. So thank you for coming on again, brother. I appreciate the conversation and definitely gonna let's, let's uh, stay in touch. <laughs> Not 100 percent. It's definitely a long term relationship. I appreciate everybody that's tuned in. Make sure y'all don't say nothing too crazy in them comments because yeah, we're trying to monetize this. So I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. And I'm and y'all, y'all out. <laughs> y'all heard you say it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank y'all. Y'all can find me on pgdtv.online. And then make sure y'all tune into my streams too, because I stream every Monday and Wednesday. I'm on YouTube and on Twitch. And you can find me on TikTok. On uh, YouTube, it is PTG TV. On TikTok, it's Escaping the Matrix, because I think we trapped into a matrix that we need to escape ourselves out of. So until the next time, make sure y'all take your L's for the day. You live, love, and laugh. Until then, make yourself.